Dear spectators, uh, welcome to this uh, second part of my Bali lectures. So now we change the, the environment. We are now at my home, at the piano. Uh, it's easier for me to play and, and talk from here. So um, and you have all the schedule of the, the whole course uh, with seven different themes, which I shall um, uh, deal, uh, not perhaps just in the chronological order, but, but in principle, basically including. And now um, today I thought uh, to start with um, uh, three uh, what I call them, uh, Flying Dutchman, uh, Loingreen, and, and Tannhäuser. And then at the same time we can a little bit uh, deepen our knowledge about the, uh, my methodology, which I'm going to use in my uh, rather large treatise on Wagner forthcoming, namely this um, existential semiotics method, which I directly apply to, to Wagner and his life and his work and several aspects, but I promise it would not be too difficult for you. <laughs> well, anyway, um, last time we uh, went through a little bit his life and um, uh, these early operas, uh, the, uh, of course Rienzi was mentioned, um, this is prayer as the first uh, genuinely Wagnerian theme, perhaps, but then we, we come to the, the Flying Dutchman, uh, whose idea came to his mind during his uh, trip to Riga, Latvia, where he was um, uh, chief of, of the orchestra as a, uh, his um, fir um, first job, we could say. Um, and um, namely, it was that, that famous uh, uh, sea journey from uh, Riga to, to Norway and, and England. Uh, it was supposed to be only the, just a um, uh, holiday journey, but, but um, a storm broke and suddenly this one week journey became at least three and a half week uh, long and uh, with a um, uh, really frightening storm in which they, they almost um, lost all their things and maybe their the lives as, as well. So uh, Richard was there with his uh, Minna, his first wife Minna Planer and his dog Robert. Um, and as I told you there was, there was one Finn there named the uh, Silverman Mr. Koski who was very silent and mute but, but whom the uh, dog didn't like at all. Anyway, they, after the storm, they finally find a shelter at the uh, Norwegian uh, fjord, Sandviken, it was quiet, and there he heard these um, um, calls by um, sailor men, uh, which he said later uh, gave him the first motive to the uh, balladic atmosphere of the whole opera, The Flying Dutchman. Anyway, the journey continued from um, uh, Norway to England, uh, to London, and then from London to Paris, uh, which then followed and we started a new phase in his life. The, the Flying Dutchman, this um, uh, uh, plot of the opera is based upon the uh, story by Heidi Heine of the Memoire des Herren von Schnabele Wopski. So it's a bit ironic title and, um, and uh, the opera itself, if you think, uh, its first prose draft was in 1840, so early, and then poem uh, uh, 41, and music started to be written in uh, 1840, and, and first performance in Dresden in uh, 43, uh, and, and, and so, and then later performed in many other houses. And the main roles are Daland, a Norwegian sailorman, um, captain. Senta, his daughter, Erik, a huntsman who is the um, who is supposed to be the, the husband of Senta, and then Mary, Senta's nurse, who is leading the uh, the choir of the of the ladies who are sewing the uh, scene, and then um, Dalam Stierman, and then the Dutchman himself, the, the main main role. Uh, no, <laughs> the plot is uh, of course. No, no, by, by, but if I just repeat that, the uh, first act is that um, there is very stormy music of Ouverture, uh, which opens this hall and it's very characteristic. <laughs> This is uh, open D minor, D minor field, uh, D minor tonality is uh, very important. It's this uh, demoniac, demonic uh, character, and of course this empty sound, fifth fourth sound, it's stemming off from 
uh, a D minor from uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which was uh, for Richard Wagner his most important um, um, composition of the of this classical tradition, which uh, uh, brought him, in fact, back to the more symphonic composing than his earlier theater experiences. But anyway, it opens with this and uh, very typical is that this um, uh, overture is already uh, traditionally based on the main motifs which later appear in the opera, namely, of course, we had this uh, uh, storm motif, um, and then it is followed by Andante. But uh, this is the motive of the redemption, is a lösungs theme, which appears as early as here. Later, I remember knowing in Pacifal, it's uh, the main theme, the redemption here. But uh, here it is already in this uh, motive by English horn and, and other uh, wood instruments and, and horns. And um, it has been noted by several like Dahlhaus and Kunz that it is, this motive is very strongly um, um, emphasized at, towards the end because here the um, Dominant chord appears only in the fourth phrase. Uh, so it's uh, just on, on quite at the end, it is typical. Um, anyway, um, it is typical that this um, the kind of motif of uh, the Flying Dutchman appears always quite suddenly as a surprise. So it's, it's like a shock always when it appears in the opera. So it is not prepared by, by, by any, any uh, sequences or development, but it just appears there. And um, when the opera starts, uh, we are uh, in the, um, uh, Dutch, the Dallas ship has anchored. In, uh, and, and by the way, it is not Norway, it should be Scotland, for example, but it was uh, mm. somehow uh, because of this uh, journey by Wagner thought to be. Um, and then um, the Flying Dutchman's ship is always also there, but it is, um, is there um, totally silent. And the Dutchman appears and tells in his monologue how he is permitted to come to the land only once in every seven years uh, to search for love of some woman who would just, um, without any condition, to love him, love him and then so to say, offer, offer, offer her to him. Um, so then the da Dutchman asks um, Captain Dahlan to, to be that he, they can harbor there and stay there and ask for hospitality and, and um, offers uh, riches, all kinds of wealthy things and of course Dalan accepts. Second act uh, uh, starts in the Dalan's house and here we have the, there are those um, Grosse Zimmer im Hause Dalans uh, and on the, uh, on the wall there, is, there are uh, pictures and there is a um, picture of, of this um, fine Dutchman and of course we have this uh, music of these um, sewing ladies. <laughs> It's sort of Mendelssohnian lightness and, uh, and um, uh, also here uh, some kind of, um, not narrative, but uh, uh, balladic or, or fairy tale atmosphere. Now then uh, Senta is uh, sitting there in the side of this uh, uh, lady's choir and doesn't uh, uh, sing anything. And, and then um, when she's asked about her silence, then she explains that uh, that um, uh, she is waiting for this uh, Dutchman. And then um, 
she sings this famous um, ballad, ballet, um, and before that uh, it is, uh, um, we heard this Dutchman motif suddenly. <laughs> starts um, singing Johore, uh, Johore, it's kind of onomatopoetic uh, singing a uh, little bit uh, like the Valkyrie uh, later, uh, I would say. first musical idea Wagner had about this opera. So, and that is very typical of his composing. Um, there are two theories about how he, after all, did his operas. The first theory is that um, he was, um, it was all theater, and that he always first wrote the libretto and the uh, vocal lines, the texts, which could be sung, and only thereafter he harmonized them and then orchestrated this. this. But anyway, this, this um, uh, vocal line and the text um, was absolutely the, the, the priority uh, in his uh, work. There is a theory by Martin Knust, a young, uh, very gifted uh, German music scholar, who thinks that Wagner Dorothy was theater uh, until the end of the uh, 20th century, and only in, in um, 20. Uh, Yes, at the end of the 19th century, only at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, people thought to think that it's music in, in the first place. But this, um, that is one theory. But the other one is that um, uh, he always started with some musical atmosphere, some basic idea, musical idea, which uh, suddenly surrounded him and which uh, later dictated um, uh, all what, what he wrote in, in prose. And we have evidence. Uh, um, Later, like in the, the Meistersinger, for instance, in Meistersinger, the whole prelude was written first before any, any text uh, at all. Well, by the way, the method was said by like, Giuseppe Verdi. Vir Traviata was already the music before he put the words there. So Wagner obviously also had something similar. He, had, uh, he said that um, uh, when the libretto was written, the whole opera was already done because he had in his mind the music, very strong um, inner image what the music should be and what, what it will be. So that is exciting. And for the Flying Dutchman, it means that this central ballet in D minor is the central issue, central theme, and central motif, and, and um, somehow main, main thing in the whole opera uh, from which everything started. The same we'll see in Lohengrin, the same it's the the um, bridal scene, scene in the chamber, it was, he was written first, uh, the melody, and then all other things came later surrounding it. Anyway, Senta is sitting there and uh, steering that picture of the strange man, and then come the, the Captain Dara, his father, and, 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 um, and Dutchman, and then uh, the father promises Senta to, to, uh, to Dutchman. Um, as, as his bride, and Senta is quite willingly accepts it. Third act, um, uh, we are back in the very rocky shore. There are the uh, Norwegian ship is there, and sailors are making very uh, merry fest on the de deck. So they are, they are celebrating something. Maybe they are coming to the earth. There is between um, some areas which are because uh, this is still written in the traditional Italian opera style that they are separate numbers. Areas. It, this is not, not yet this uh, unentic melody, but if there are like uh, some are melodically very beautiful, like uh, Dalans aria, uh, 
about his daughter, Mirch do my kind, name this. Um. <laughs> Das Akkordeon norwegischen Matrosen und Ensemble Steuermann äh, lasst die Wacht singen, und dann haben wir das Motiv. Characteristic um, uh, sea maritime or sea atmosphere with this um, melody. But the, uh, the, the other boat, uh, which is just there, totally mute, uh, doesn't react in any way. And then the very cheerful uh, uh, Norwegian sermon that they want to um, invite this uh, fly Dutchman to the same party, to this uh, fest. And they, and they, um, uh, they sing and they, they, they try to um, awaken them, so uh, they sing something like uh, Die Watson, ha ha ha, weckt sie nicht auf, they don't, they are not awakened, they are sleeping there, uh, so it is... Uh, <laughs> deep silence, and then comes this, uh, so it ended the C major, and suddenly comes this uh, uh, chord of uh, C sharp minor, with by horse and, and bassoons, in pianissimo. So a very, very, uh, <laughs> I see a totally rather radical solution, after all, and it is repeated, uh, they again try to wait. <laughs> That's very, very dramatic. That is very um, much like Hector Berlioz. It's the famous Berliozian uh, aesthetic, the land prévu, the aesthetics of the um, uh, un unpredictable, something which is very, uh, very surprising. But at the end, um, uh, then come, comes um, uh, come this um, uh, Dutchman with Senta, and then at the end, um, the Dutchman says that uh, now he has to go, and, and uh, that he will uh, he will release Senta from her, her promise to be be his uh, uh, his bride, and he will so Senta will stay on the earth and he will disappear. And then um, the Dutchman, the boat disappears, but then Senta is so devoted to her that uh, Senta throws herself to the sea, and at the end, at the same time, the Dutchman the boat sinks down. On the sea, and uh, then we see on the sky Senta as a transfigured uh, dust line. And then we have uh, here this uh, this uh, motif of the um, redemption. We are yes, then we are uh, if we were in D minor. Uh, <laughs> So it ends in D major. By the way, it's a nice observation by Christian Thielemann, the famous conductor, that um, every Wagner's opera closes or ends with a major chord. No opera ends with a minor chord. So um, Wagner always wants to give at the end something, the ray of hope or something uh, uh, positive, even uh, if the, the events are very tragical in, in the opera itself. But, uh, so it is, we are also here in D major, not in, in, in D minor. So that is the whole opera, and um, uh, this balladic atmosphere is certainly quite central, which is created by, by this um, musical means, I would say. 
Now then, um, Larry came from London to Paris and started the new phase. Uh, this uh, uh, Paris phase was, um, how would I say, perhaps um, psychologically and, and economically the poorest period of his life, really. Uh, quite disastrous in many ways. He had to suffer almost as he was starving there. He was almost put to prison for his debts. Uh, he could make only his living by by um, um, proofreading Italian operas and uh, making um, piano arrangements of uh, Donizetti's Fra Diavolo and, and others. But good side was that he learned then the Italian opera conventions, which he then later mastered pretty well, as we can see in many operas. So he, he, um, he was in Paris, he tried to, uh, he met Meyer there with whom he had later a um, hatred relation because he thought Meyerbeer had, had just been an obstacle in his career and, and Meyerbeer had just um, prevented his operas to be performed in Grand Opera. He saw, of course, Grand Opera and he, uh, of course, that gave his dream that uh, I could also bring about something which would be so magnificent uh, as they could. Especially he saw the Huguenotten, Huguenot by Meyerbeer, which was um, with all decoration and uh, mise en scène was uh, totally impressive. But he also heard uh, um, orchestra music and he later said that um, some performances by, by French orchestras just uh, um, um, rescued him the bad theatre uh, musical taste which he had learned in, in Germany. So he uh, then admits that, uh, admitted that he, he might be a, a composer in, in the first place. And the um, decisive experience here was uh, when Hector Berlioz performed the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. He said that he had heard that in Germany, but, but it, was, it was quite poor. Now the first time he heard this Ninth Symphony, which then became uh, for him the, the most important symphony piece altogether, we can say. He also heard other pieces by uh, Berlioz, like uh, Symphony Fantastique, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and, and uh, he said that, uh, well, I'm only a schoolboy in the side of this great Berlioz and, and he, uh, how he masters the, the orchestra. Uh, then in Paris, um, conditions were, were rather <laughs> bad. He, he got adopted uh, this um, negative attitude against French culture, civilization altogether. So French culture was civilization, civilization opposed to the culture, Geist, spirit, which was the German, which was profound. Civilization was superficial, frivolous. It was um, <laughs> oriented to the commodities of life, where was only the Germans had them. Uh, and so he had this um, negative view on, on uh, French culture for the rest of his life, uh, so that um, uh, when the uh, Prussian uh, French war broke 1871, he, only, he was only glad to hear that uh, Louvre was in flames and Paris was bombed by, by Germans. However, he admitted that the only big city in which he would like to live outside Germany was Paris, just. So it was very paradoxical after all his, all Wagner's um, uh, attitudes um, in, in many respects, I would say. Um, but he learned, of course, French language quite perfectly well, uh, but um, he started to miss his German uh, roots and started to study um, some literary sources, which then gave the idea to Lohengrin. So he uh, <coughs> learned Lohengrin legend uh, from uh, uh, many publications. Uh, he read the uh, uh, Zimrocks uh, and St. Martin's books on Parsifal and Tuturel, and also by the poet Wolfram von Eschenbach uh, texts, and, um, and many, many issues where which it was for him certainly as almost exile in, in Paris was very, very important. And so um, <clears throat> he started to compose this um, Lohengrin and also Tannhäuser. Now we must remember that uh, Wagner did not write one opera after the other, but he had almost all the operas simultaneously in his mind. So he, he had rather early the vision how many operas he will write altogether. And so um, uh, that was the Reality. And um, in Lohengrin, um, how would I say, of course, the um, plot, uh, the events, it's romantic opera, 
uh, text prose uh, 1845 uh, and music finished in 46 um, and then first performance in Weimar 1850 it was by Franz Liszt because then Wagner had already had his Dresden uh, revolution and he, he was exiled from Germany he couldn't return back to Germany for a very long time um, now this takes place in um, in um, Saxon and Turing, Turing in Germany in the Middle Ages. Uh, there are Brabant, Brabant's noblemen and noble women, uh, Parsis, Vassals, and they are threatened by the Hungarians from the east who, who, who are attacking soon them. And their king, Heinrich, in the first act, uh, greets his, his um, army. That now, now there is this imminent invasion which is threatening that they need to be saved. But then there is the, the main issue is that the, the um, Friedrich von Telramund, who is the gangster figure, accuses Elsa, who is, the, um, uh, I think uh, she is the daughter of King Heinrich. She, Elsa would have murdered her brother Gottfried uh, quite young in order to, to, to get the throne, uh, uh, crown, I think. But then the Elsa is there accused, and uh, by the and then the, um, they decide that um, it will be decided whether he's guilty or not by a, by a struggle or fight between um, Telramund, who is accusing, and men. Anyone in the audience knights can come and, and fight for Elsa, and if, if uh, uh, depending who wins, that decides if Elsa is guilty or not. Well, that is the old German uh, law, <laughs> justice. Uh, uh, which was applied here. Okay, the, the, the duel is declared to start and they, they, they um, open it uh, so anyone can, uh, can enter to defend the Elsa, but there is silence. Second time, the same. Then Elsa uh, sings her, her prayer that, that, that she will be rescued, and then happens uh, this uh, miracle, which is a legend feature in the, this. You know, legend is a uh, folklore genre in which uh, the miracle happens and namely the, 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 the whole people sees on the sea how the, something approaches there is a swan or swans they are, they are pulling a boat and in the boat there is some uh, knight uh, in the white costume and they land and the, the, the man enters the knight and uh, said that uh, I, will, I will fight for Elsa. And so the um, duel starts and then the Terramund is, is one and so Elsa is uh, declared um, innocent in this case. And then King Heinrich promises Elsa uh, as the spouse to the, this um, unknown, unknown man. The only condition here that is that, that Elsa should never ask the name of, of this knight, who he is. So his identity must be hidden. So that's the, the first act altogether. Second act uh, starts with the uh, plots, uh, with the intrigues of, of Terramund and, um, and um, Ortrud, who is, an, uh, I think, uh, his, his wife, yes. And they live in the old pagan uh, world of, of magic. So they, 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 there is no, no Christian element at all, but they are in pagan world and they they call the uh, spirits to, to help them, and then the uh, Ortrud get, um, finds the idea that they must, um, uh, they must um, persuade Elsa to ask the name of Lohengrin. They, then this, um, this, um, this, um, they will get rid of that, that problem which they have because um, Terramund wants to become the king. Okay, then uh, they start to celebrate, the, there is a wedding scene which is very famous, with the um, uh, wedding march, which is very much <laughs> used almost uh, as much as the Mendelssohn uh, wedding march. Uh, I once heard it in Buffalo, United States, where I know there was a wedding party. They played Loing Ring as wedding march, so it's, I think, um, universally well known. And um, uh, the bridal procession uh, tries to enter the, the church, but then in the last step, Ortrud intervenes and says that. Um, uh, accuses loyalty of sorcery and that um, he is a false hero uh, but uh, they, they continue they, they are silenced and then but Othrud has already 
put the suspicion in Elsa's mind that who is this unknown man. Then um, Act 3 starts in the bridal chamber with Elsa and Loin we have dialogue their first time alone. And here we have the music which, which is um, just the came first one in mind. It's very by the way, in this opera we might have already a um, little bit light motif technique, namely because if we think of its uh, only of its um, prelude, uh, we have this A major tonality, which is the tonality of the um, of the graph. And there are many uh, also uh, just I uh, did some of music. Uh, this um, well, this um, A major. So. the bridal, bridal um, possession. about which Wagner tells himself um, as his music um, uh, technically how it's written in this um, um. through seven tonalities. It is uh, first the uh, E-flat major, then uh, the C-flat uh, C major, G-flat major, and then it goes in harmonically to the um, F-sharp minor, A major, then only A major, and then we get back again to the uh, flattened area, nearly. über die Aufwendung von Musik auf Drama, warum erzählst du das, how this idea to go modulate through different keys uh, just is correspond to the uh, poetic idea of different, different atmospheres here. But as I said, um, um, what is important, uh, the first motif, uh, well, and of course you know, <laughs> this is the But um, this um, third act beginning, this um, start with this um, Sehr ruhig, this Loinlin uh, and Elsa der Duetta.
out. So he, he was quite uh, melodic. If, I will always wonder how in this uh, book by History of Melody, um, Benke Shabbat uh, denies totally <laughs> the melodic uh, invention from Richard Wagner. He said they are always uh, somehow artificial and, 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 and not, <laughs> not so beautiful his melody, but uh, of course he reads, uh, he reads quite uh, high melodic achievements and, uh, and when he invented something really beautiful he gave it to the much to the, to the audience many times because he, he knew that uh, that's something people want to hear again. Um, I heard in, uh, in Berlin uh, in the restaurant uh, principal um, <laughs> it holds uh, true for the food but also the music namely that um, Lieber etwas Gutes und dafür ein bisschen mehr. So rather something nice but something more. And with something more he, he always gives and, and so um, also in um, that's up to, uh, in, in already in. But this uh, opening harmonies <laughs> if you think of the Valkyrie and the famous scene in this Brunhild uh, had dialogue with uh, Sigmund and changes her mind uh, and when Brunhilde is uh, deeply moved suddenly by the Sigmund and Sigmund the love uh, we have this motif <laughs> Similar idea here in the uh, as in Loing, so that the similar dramatic situation evokes in composer's mind similar types of musical uh, solutions for this. Uh, however, this um, then it's interesting that it starts a dialogue, and then Elsa wants to learn that who is Loing Ring, which was just forbidden, and he does the in this more and more and uh, the tries to uh, persuade that please don't don't ask about that but he, he she continues um, and then it appears that the Teldamund's men they, they suddenly attack and then there is a fight between Teldamund and Loyalin and Loyalin um, kills uh, Teldamund and then Loyalin says that well tomorrow I shall tell who I am to the whole whole Brabant, pe all Brabant people uh, then comes the last act, and the, uh, the transition music is very impressive. March. Uh, there is the Brabant army is there in the on the shore of the of the um, uh, lake or what it is. It's um, just the morning is starting, uh, and uh, there is the this very lively, not march, but some kind of music uh, of the of the awakening. It is uh, uh, impressive. So, And at the end we came to C major. So uh, this is very interesting music. And then um, uh, Long appears, and then he tells his uh, 
famous uh, graph store he reveals that he is Loivi, his name is Loivi, and he is son of Parsifal. And he had just come to, to, to save Elsa. But then he has to leave, uh, and um, uh, then the folk sees how the swan approaches. They are quite horrified. Swan, swan comes again. And, and um, swan comes, but then swan is transformed into the prince Gottfried, who was the disappeared brother of Elsa. Gottfried is now alive, and he, he appears, and and Loewin gives his sword and, and helmet and his, uh, all his things and uh, horn to, to Gottfried, who will become now the future king of the Brabants, and he will save them in the battle against the, the Hungarians. And then Loewin steps uh, in the boat, drawn by, by a swan, and disappears, and, um, and Elsa uh, falls down, um, lifeless, and the whole opera ends. So it is quite tragical. I must still check that this happens. <laughs> it's really in minor because there's nothing. Yes, it is. It is absolutely. <laughs> so we have there this grand motif is really. So it is the A major. So we get in A major. We started in A major, which was the tonality of the graph, and we end with this A major altogether. Now that is Loewin, um, uh, which was not a big problem to Wagner because he did not just uh, rewrite it or revise it. Uh, but then this third um, young rocker, Elinid Tannhäuser, was much, much more problematic. Tannhäuser und der Sängerkrieg auf Wartburg, Tannhäuser and the Singers' Contest on the Wartburg whose idea also came to his mind in, in Paris um, years. Um, so, and here um, uh, we have, um, in fact, we have two versions. There's the there's Dresden version, uh, which was um, um, first performed, first the prose daft in 1842, and then performed in Dresden in uh, 45. And then there is this Paris version, which is in 1861, 1861 Paris Opera, uh, which Wagner thought would be a big success and open his career in Paris altogether. He was then invited by Napoleon uh, number three to do the opera, but, but in Paris, the, the town uh, opera life is full of, of um, intrigues. The, the um, um, Paul Metternich, who was the uh, wife of Napoleon, I, I think, uh, had been behind this invitation, and he was uh, hated by the French no nobility, and so the um, jockey club arranged just a whistling scandal, so they, they just, in three performances, they just prevented its performances, and so it had to be taken away from the program altogether. So it was uh, three, uh, only three times performed, although it had had uh, 164 rehearsals, to bring it to stage, so it was a other big. Now, um, a major difference between this Dresden and the Paris version is that there is uh, this ballet scene, which was quite necessary in Paris opera, was much expanded in Paris because Wagner thought that well, the, uh, the um, audience will come only to, to see the, the ballet, so that the young men come to see their favorite dancers and then dine later with them. So they used to come only in the second act. So they missed the first act because in the second act was the place of the ballet scene. And so this ballet scene was just this Venusberg Bacchanal act, which became huge, very big in the Paris version. The Tannhäuser, the um, plot, again, there is this, um, there are also old stories um, uh, behind uh, this, which Wagner studied. Uh, and the plot is um, so that um, um, in the first act there is a um, um, knight, um, Tannhäuser, he is approaching the, his, um, his um, home in Thüringen and meets the uh, pilgrim, pilgrims, which are just uh, making pilgrims to, to Rome. And uh, um, his knight fellows greet him with uh, friendship and invite him to um, attend the uh, song contest, which is coming soon. Now, Tannhäuser uh, at the beginning is um, 
uh, in the Venusberg. The Venus is the goddess of the sensual pleasure, so it's used to be like like, like that. Uh, and but uh, Tannhäuser wants to wants to leave it and, and get back to his um, his to Wartburg, Wartburg uh, castle. Second act opens with Elizabeth, who is the uh, beloved of Tannhäuser. Uh, she is greeting the the, the hall, this is like how uh, in top, uh, and Danhäuser comes and they celebrate the union and the um, Landgrave um, opens the song competition and then they all sing, Wolfram from Eschenbach sings his song and then and Walter from the Vogelweide and then Danhäuser comes and sings his quite uh, uh, scandalous song praising Venusberg and Venus, whereas all the others they are just um, um, only praising the virtuous life of the of, of the knights, so that is quite upsetting. And then um, um, Tannhäuser is um, is banished, and Landgrave tells that he must make a um, pilgrim journey to get salvation uh, in Rome. Third act: Elizabeth um, is uh, on stage, and he is she's following how the pilgrims return from the. Rome, and here we have, of course, the second time the, the famous uh, Pilgrim Choir song, the main theme of the opera. Um, Tannhäuser is not there, and then Elsa leaves and just disappears somewhere. Um, Wolfram comes and sings the hymn for the evening star. Wolfram, who is, um, the, that is one melody which is also well known in this. Uh, and then uh, at the end, Elizabeth has died, but his death has has um, announced by the bells, and but he has rescued the Tannhäuser's soul. Tannhäuser also dies, but then the choir uh, tells that the, um, something unreal happening. The Pope had in Rome told that the Tannhäuser will, will never be uh, uh, get redemption, and that will happen rather than the Pope's staff would would get green leaves. But then at the end this happens. So miracle happens and Tannhäuser's Tan soul is saved. So that is the whole thing. Now, uh, in Tannhäuser music, um, uh, Tannhäuser Wagner thought to rewrite many, many times. He, uh, in his last years he was thinking that he, he might take it again because he was uh, always uh, dissatisfied uh, with its music. Um, of course, it has. Uh, I already remember all this. Uh <laughs> it is quite which is the main, which, uh, which ends also when they sing Dulce Gnade Heil, so uh, holy through the, the mercy. By the way, Wagner was of course totally. Uh, Protestant, he was Lutheran. That's that's why he saw this uh, song criticism about against Pope altogether, and uh, and um, so this Protestantism is was very important. So that when he when he married Cosima von Bülow, uh, originally Dagut from Paris, he was Catholic of course. Cos Cosima had to be, be converted to the Catholicism, and, and and she tried to become very very Catholic. This which um, Wagner of, often find rather amusing, amusing after all. But anyway, there is much uh, quite wonderful attractive music uh, which explains why Tannhäuser is one of the most popular operas Wagner ever wrote. Of course, we have uh, this famous... <laughs>
more fun uh, song to the evening star is of course one of the most beautiful. But also this um, March part, the uh, coming of the guests to the Wartburg is is something which is uh, uh, typical of Wagner, this um, um, rather messy scenes which he still wrote in his early operas, a uh, little bit Im Im imitating the, the French, um, uh, French uh, Meyer there type opera. Uh, later in his book, um, Opera and Drama, he criticized just the use of choirs as the folk, so that they, they were not just the... And then comes the... Descending mo uh, movement in his progress. And in, then the middle part of the uh, march has more beautiful melodies. Uh. So um, this was his output he had uh, um, before uh, he left for, for uh, Dresden uh, and became there, uh, his Dresden years, uh, very important. Uh, and um, uh, the first time he could uh, somehow establish his life uh, economically and, and professionally. And um, he gathered a huge library uh, whose catalog we bring later, this library, of course, he had to. Uh, leave it all together to, to Germany when he went to exile, but um, this library reveals that he was an extremely learned person. So the library contained um, all kinds of uh, poetry and, and uh, literature from antiquity, Aristotle, Euripides, Sophocles, Aeschylus, all, all he knew, uh, then, then come into Dante and then to uh, medieval authors and then of course German literature, Goethe, uh, Schiller, Heine, all this um, Hegel, such some philosophy. So, so he was extremely learned, and, and many people admired just the, uh, Wagner's high erudition. The fact is that he had studied philosophy a little bit, but, but uh, his writings reveal that he was, uh, um, how would I say, <laughs> this, um, they are not true philosophy in, in, in any way. And one of the most serious mistakes which we can do when studying Wagner, that you think that his musical output would have been just an um, enactment of his theoretical, philosophical, or quasi-philosophical ideas he put in his writings. There is uh, definitely a gap between what he wrote as three thesis and then with music. And this is very important to know because um, uh, many of his pamphlets uh, they were um, irritating people. They were simply said that we could now say hatred speech against different um, groups and, and nations and, and, and races. So, so uh, as we know, uh, so he damaged his own reputation so that people had negative opinion of him even before they had heard a note of his music, so to say. But we might say that Wagner was one of the first uh, media figures. He, he knew that the um, uh, main thing is that people are talking about me. Whether good or bad is not so important, but they have to talk about me. And in that he, he, he was <laughs> quite successful, uh, uh, we can say. But maybe we really discuss this in, in the second lecture, this, uh, his writings, and, and then go further towards his major work, maybe Nibelung and Ring, of course, whose ideas were majoring in his mind. And then his special new composing techniques like 
or light motifs and another is used which are natural.